Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington presents World Focus, a continuing series on international political, social, economic, and cultural issues. Good evening. I'm Joel Migdal, a member of the Jewish Studies Program and Associate Director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. Welcome to another in our series of lectures by distinguished visitors to the University of Washington's Jewish Studies Program. The Jewish Studies Program is part of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. The program consists of approximately a dozen faculty members teaching in humanities and social sciences. The courses cover the gamut of Jewish history from ancient times until the present, as well as the precepts of Jewish religion. The faculty also offers an undergraduate major in Jewish studies. For the last 10 years, the Jewish Studies Program has presented the Samuel and Althea Strom Lectureship in Jewish Studies. This lecture series has become a major community event in Seattle and has also gained wide recognition around the country and abroad as a result of the books which have been published based on the lectures. One such book, Zachor, Jewish History and Jewish Memory by Yosef Yerushalmi, won the National Jewish Book Prize in History. Important books have also appeared by Joseph Don on mysticism and Yehuda Bauer on the Holocaust, among others. All these books have been published by the University of Washington Press. The lecture series has been made possible by a generous gift on the part of Samuel and Althea Strom, who have been important benefactors for the growth of Jewish studies at the University of Washington. The Strom lecturer in 1985 was William G. Deaver. The topic of his lectures was recent archaeological discoveries and biblical research. Deaver is professor of Oriental Studies at the University of Arizona and an internationally acclaimed archaeologist and lecturer. He received his doctorate from Harvard in 1964 and from 1964 to 1968 taught at the Nelson Glick School of Biblical Archaeology in Jerusalem, where he also served as director until 1971. For the past 20 years, Professor Deaver was supervised, has supervised and directed excavations in Israel and Jordan. He has accumulated a host of prizes and fellowships, including the Persia Shimo Prize of the Israel Museum in 1982, and a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship in 1981-82. He currently serves as the editor of the Bulletin of the American Schools of Oriental Research. Deaver has a host of books and monographs and articles. Many of those are on his famous excavations in Gezer, where he has uncovered tremendously important artifacts to help us illuminate the world of the ancient Israelites and the Bible. It is my great pleasure to present to you Professor William G. Deaver speaking on recent archaeological discoveries and biblical research. Professor Migdal, members of the Judaic Studies faculty and the academic community, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be invited and an honor as well to deliver these lectures. Uh, I know many of my distinguished predecessors and have the highest regard for all of them. I only hope that I can measure up to the high standard already set. It is also a pleasure uh, to be invited because it forces me to put into writing some of the thoughts that have been stirring around in my head for almost 20 years on the relationship of archaeology and the Bible. I hope uh, I can interest you in some of these ideas. Tonight might be a bit heavy going uh, on introductory matters. Uh, in the next two lectures, I will try to give you case studies of how archaeology can illustrate the world of the Bible with lots of pretty pictures. Uh, but tonight, we have first to cover some introductory matters. For the overall title of these lectures, I've chosen uh, the topic, Recent Archaeological Discoveries and Biblical Research. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Artifacts, Ecofacts, and Textual Facts, How Archaeology Today Can Illuminate the World of the Bible. Archaeology and Bible, two simple household words in America, often coupled together, understood, I suppose, by everybody. But are they understood properly? If so, why are both subject to such controversy? And what can archaeology contribute to our understanding of the Bible? These are the problems I wish to address in the following three lectures. 
The first will introduce the problem in general by looking at the nature and recent development of both biblical studies and archaeology, then by laying the groundwork for a new and I think more productive relationship between these two disciplines. The second and third lectures will illustrate our approach by taking as case studies two important eras in Israelite history. First, the period of the settlement in Canaan, and secondly, the period of religious development during the monarchy. In each case, I shall try to show by means of recent discoveries what archaeology, properly coupled with textual studies, can contribute to the illumination of the life and times of ancient Israel. I want to stress at the beginning how selective we have to be, given the flood of new light from archaeological discoveries. As a result, our evidence will be drawn largely from excavations and surveys in Israel, done in the last 10 years, most still unpublished. I shall further restrict this inquiry concerning the Bible and archaeology to the Old Testament, or more properly, the Hebrew Bible, since New Testament archaeology, or what is sometimes called the archaeology of late antiquity, is best considered a separate discipline, one in which, fortunately, I have no confidence. First of all, I want to speak about biblical studies and look at the nature of the Hebrew Bible as a source of history. Since we're concerned here primarily with history, let us begin by asking to what extent the Hebrew Bible can be used as a source book for writing history. Underlying this question is an assumption that I hope to demonstrate to you before we are through, namely that archaeology can comment only on historical, not on theological issues. First of all, let us look at the various classes of biblical literature. The Bible is commonly referred to as a book, or indeed as the book, as both Christian and Jewish communities have dictated by regarding it as authoritative scripture. But the Bible is in reality many books, not simply because tradition and canon divided into 24 or 39 separate books, but primarily because the Bible contains a bewildering array of many types of literature. And as we shall see, only a few of these comprising a minority of biblical texts can legitimately be used by the modern historian for writing a critical history of ancient Israel. 19th and 20th century literary and other types of criticism have shown that the Bible is a composite of such diverse genres as myths, folk tales, epic, prose and poetic narratives, court annals, nationalist propaganda, historical novella, biography, genealogies, cult legends and liturgical formulae, songs and psalms, private prayers, legal corpora, oracle and prophecy, homily and didactic material, belette, erotic poetry, apocalyptic, just to mention a few. <laughs> now, the question is, which of these categories, if any, can be utilized by the modern historian or student of the Bible who wants to know what things were really like in the past and what can archaeology illustrate? Next, I want to look at problems of interpretation. Whatever degree of historical reliability we may encounter in these various literary genres in the Hebrew Bible, it is evident that all require the most careful sifting and critical interpretation before they can be used by the historian of ancient Israel. The Bible simply cannot be read at face value as history. We must begin by acknowledging that our task is made difficult, and some would say even impossible, by the very nature of even the properly historical sources and the written tradition in which they have been handed down to us. First of all, there are problems in the nature of the literary sources. In the Hebrew Bible, there is no real historiography in the modern sense. Indeed, as you may know, the word history does not occur in the Hebrew Bible, not even once. The biblical writers never claim to base themselves on factual records or to be totally objective, a modern conceit, or to cover the whole story. They're concerned not with the question, what happened, but with the larger question, what does it mean? For them and for their original readers, the Bible is not history, it is his story. The interpretation of certain happenings as seen through the eyes of faith the story of the saving acts of Yahweh, the God of Israel, on behalf of his people. To be sure, the Bible is historical in the sense that it contains an account of particular uh, peoples and places and times and occurrences, 
And that's in sharp contrast to the purely mythological literatures of many other ancient oriental religions. But concrete events are important for the biblical writers only as specific illustrations of what God is doing and what moral consequences that action has for men here and now. The modern notion of a disinterested secular history would not have been conceivable to the ancient biblical writers, and they wouldn't have been interested had they thought of it. Secondly, because of the radical theological nature of the descriptive historical portions of the Bible, the writers were highly selective in what they chose to include. They simply do not tell us much that we moderns want to know. For instance, the 8th century writers portray on a grand scale the dramatic public events of great kings and priests and prophets, but they tell us next to nothing about the daily life of the average Israelite or Judean, the man in the street. The Bible is concerned with political history, not with social or economic, much less individual history. Nowhere in the Bible, for instance, do we have more than a hint in passing about what most people looked like, what they wore or ate, how their houses and furniture appeared, what went on in the streets and plazas of the average town, how agriculture and trade were conducted, how people wrote and kept records, how they went about their daily chores, how they entertained themselves, what they did after dark, how long they lived and what they died of, how they were buried at death, and a host of other matters. As we shall see, these are precisely the details that archaeology can supply. The Bible tells us about the world of the spirit. Archaeology fills in a knowledge of material culture and daily life, and both are necessary if we are to comprehend life in ancient Israel in all its full variety and vitality. Third, we face a difficulty in trying to read the Bible in, as history in that virtually all of its accounts in their present written form are later than the events they describe, sometimes centuries later. The Bible was not really put together before about the second century uh, BC, after a very long and complicated process of oral and literary transmission. Few of the texts are eyewitness accounts. And finally, not only are our historical texts in the Bible late, but they are elitist, particularly in the case of those texts dealing with religion, as I hope to show in the third lecture. The Bible was written by and for the upper classes, and the biblical texts were interpreted, preserved, and transmitted by these elites. The Bible as we have it, for instance, is almost exclusively the end product of the royal court and the priestly establishment in Jerusalem. Now these are problems in the nature of the text. I want now to look for a moment at problems in the transmission of the text as it has come down to us, as though these problems weren't enough. The Masoretic manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible on which all of our modern printed Bibles are based are called collectively the Textus Receptus, the received text. But how did we receive it, and in what form, and by what manner. How old is this text? How accurately does it reflect the lost originals? And thus, how close is it to the truth of what really happened? It must always be remembered that the Masoretic text is medieval, about the 9th century AD, and that even our oldest fragments of manuscripts date back only about to the Roman era, for instance, in the Dead Sea Scrolls copies. And that despite fanatically careful copying by scribes over many centuries, there are certain texts in the Hebrew Bible that have become so corrupt that they simply cannot be translated with any degree of certainty. We must constantly keep in mind that the Bible is only a fragment of a very ancient literature in a dead language. Until the discoveries of modern archaeology, it was in fact the sole relic of a long lost culture, the product of an ancient oriental conceptual world totally foreign to most of us. We must, therefore, beware of the peril of modernizing the Bible. It is not a modern document. Pious believers who read only modern English translations of the biblical text are often unaware of the long transmission process and therefore speak of the plain meaning of Scripture. Now, if there were any such thing, we obviously would have none of the violent controversies that have always surrounded the interpretation of the Bible. And I and a lot of other professors wouldn't have any jobs either. <laughs> and you need to be aware that that process of controversy began already 
at the time the scriptures were being formed and had come to be regarded as scripture. These controversies continue right up to the present moment, and they will no doubt come up under questions tonight. Now here again, the attraction that archaeology holds is that it promises to render many of these difficult passages more intelligible, either by finding parallel texts that may explain enigmatic phrases, as for instance the Ugaritic texts have done brilliantly for the Psalms, or else by putting biblical texts back into their original context so as to restore their full meaning. Next, I want to turn to a view of the Bible that will regard it, properly as an archaeologist should, as a curated artifact. In the light of what I have just said about the nature of the biblical texts themselves and the way they've come down to us, I'm going to put forward a novel and you may think bold approach to the Hebrew Bible, but one drawn from archaeology. May I suggest that it will be helpful to compare the Bible to other relics from antiquity, indeed to view it in archaeological terminology as a curated artifact. First, an artifact. Well, it is clear that the Bible is an artifact, that is something fabricated by the human brain and hand. It is a shaped material object that, like any other object, reflects the human thought and behavior that produced it. It is thus a symbol, the visible reality that points to an invisible reality beyond it, or as I was raised in the catechism, the outward sign of an inward truth. The concept of the Bible that I'm advancing as an artifact is not as revolutionary as it may first seem, nor does it necessarily detract from the Bible as scripture, that is, finally, as a divine rather than merely a human product. My view simply highlights and stresses what most of us instinctively know, that the Bible, after all, is best not read in a literalistic sense, but rather in a symbolic sense. Even more so than other language, this God language is symbolic. It is only an approximation of ultimate reality. The Bible is not the word of God in itself, as the fundamentalist doctrine of verbal inspiration holds, but rather becomes the word of God, insofar as it points beyond itself to the God who stands above all human description, indeed beyond history. Now, the, the reason I wish to regard the Bible here as an artifact, though not simply that, is so that I may show how the problems of its interpretation are remarkably similar to those of archaeological artifacts. If I am correct, then the two disciplines of our present inquiry are organically related, more so than earlier biblical archaeologists thought, but for different reasons. Think of it perhaps this way. The study of all artifacts, including texts, is subject to certain restrictions. First, artifacts do not come conveniently labeled as to what they are or what they mean. In theory, the message is there, but we have to decode it. When my son was about three years old, he was playing with some potsherds, broken fragments of ancient Israelite pottery in the courtyard of the Jerusalem school. And I asked him, Sean, are those uh, potsherds middle bronze one or two? He looked at them for a moment and said, how should I know? They don't have any numbers on them. <laughs> and they don't. We have to supply the numbers and the labels and the meanings. And this is just as true of a biblical passage as it is an ancient object. And secondly, we often speak of both text and archaeological objects as data for reconstructing the past. These may constitute evidence, direct or indirect, but they become data, true data, that is meaningful facts only as they are interpreted and that we have to supply. And finally, even the best interpretation is only an educated guess. We can never know exactly what an ancient text meant to its author or its original readers, or a pot to its makers and users, because we cannot get back into their world, much less into their heads. We can never really know what it was like in the past, and ironically, the sooner we get rid of that illusion, the more we shall be able to glimpse at least part of the picture clearly. Now, I've suggested the Bible is an artifact to be interpreted like others. It is also a curated artifact. For the archaeologist, an artifact may either be found in situ, in which case the context should yield clues, valuable clues to its original use, or in secondary context, in which case we say that it is curated. By that, we mean essentially that the artifact is recycled. That's nothing new, you see deliberately preserved, repaired, and or altered, and usually put to a somewhat different use 
from that for which it was originally intended. And even if the old artifact functions in the same general way, its use in a later community gives it a slightly different meaning. Now, in the case of such a curated artifact, the archaeologist must try to discover both what the object was and what it later became. For example, a broken pot may become an oil lamp, a discarded limestone mortar, a door socket, a fragment of an inscribed stone, a building block. In more extreme cases, and I could give you some examples, a ruined temple may be partially reused as a stable or a latrine. Now, which is the true use, the original or the secondary? The answer is obviously both. On analogy, the Hebrew Bible is also a curated artifact. The Bible has not been discovered in situ, in its original context, in the soil of ancient Palestine, because it was never lost. The Bible is unique in being the sole surviving relic of the ancient Near East that has been continuously preserved, refurbished, and transmitted by a living community instead of having been dug up by archaeologists centuries after its discard. Thus, the Bible is not simply what it was for its original readers in ancient Israel, but that plus what it has become over the long centuries of its continual reworking and reinterpretation by both the Jewish and Christian communities in the constantly changing situations of religious life all around the world. The Hebrew Bible is a venerable artifact, polished and burnished by loving use over 30 centuries until it is taken on a rich, subtle patina that cannot be stripped away without damaging what is beneath. But this special character of the Bible may be a handicap to the historian, though it's an advantage for the believer, for it means that if we are confined to the text itself, we cannot simply expect to penetrate behind the tradition and get directly to the events that gave rise to it. Since the Bible in its present form is a curated artifact, it tells us more perhaps about its secondary use in late antiquity or in medieval and modern times as a source book for theology and morality, especially in the Western world. It is evident that we can recover its original use as historical commentary in the Oriental world of the first millennium BC only if we can put it back into its original context. And that is precisely the contribution to understanding that archaeology can make. For it alone has the potential of turning up evidence that was frozen in time, as it were, not subject to later interpretation, buried there all those years waiting for us to find it. A parallel but more direct witness to conditions and events of the ancient period. It is as though the tradition colors the original events by filtering them through experience and faith. But archaeology allows us a fleeting glimpse of past reality without the filters on, so that it may be seen in its true colors. And as we shall note presently, these colors may strike the modern eye as unexpectedly harsh on the one hand, but nevertheless, on occasion, they illuminate the Bible with dazzling light. Now, we have tried to look first briefly at the Bible as a possible source for writing history. Let us turn now to our second discipline, archaeology, and regard it as a parallel way of viewing the past. The archaeology of ancient Palestine has always been conceived, at least in America, as intimately bound up with biblical studies. Although I shall now attempt to redefine this relationship, I do regard it, I accept it as legitimate and indeed fundamental. Let us begin by regarding archaeology, however, today as a separate discipline parallel to biblical studies. The two are parallel ways of viewing the past reality of ancient Israel first because they begin at the same point with similar data, one with textual data, the other with artifactual data, both of which have, as we have seen, posing similar problems of interpretation. And second, both disciplines have the same goal, at least at the descriptive level, that is the fullest possible reconstruction of past life ways, and if possible, thought forms. And finally, although their methods and results are usually complementary, the two disciplines are parallel in that despite our expectations, they never completely converge. To understand the relationship of these two parallel dis disciplines further then, let us turn uh, directly to archaeology. First, I want to look at some traditional definitions of archaeology. 
The story of the development of American Syro-Palestinian and biblical archaeology over the past 100 years, although dramatic and exciting, has never been fully told, nor can we tell it here. I can't tell it till certain people die because the gossipy parts are the best. Uh, but I'm waiting. But basic to comprehending this branch of archaeology, in my mind, would be the understanding that it's like a river that has two streams alternately converging and separating. The first stream is biblical archaeology. And until recently, it has been the dominant stream. By biblical archaeology, we mean the pursuit of the archaeology of the Levant, conceived primarily, all of it, as the Holy Land, with methods and objectives drawn largely from problems of biblical history. In America, this began with Edward Robinson, a Protestant biblical scholar who made his first trip to the Holy Land in the 1830s and may be rightly called the father of modern Palestinology. But it was really the American Orientalist William Foxwell Albright who deserves credit for the establishment of biblical archaeology, albeit briefly, as a respectable academic discipline. Albright was the child of American missionary parents in South America. He became the most distinguished Orientalist this country has ever produced. The mere listing of his bibliography of over 1,200 items is itself a very fat book. Having mastered Assyriology, Egyptology, and ancient Near Eastern history, before he was out of his teens, he moved on to Northwest Semitic philology and Palestinian archaeology, where he was by his 20s the acknowledged master. He could hardly wait to get to Palestine. He was afraid it would all be excavated before he could get there. For a generation, he dominated American Old Testament studies as well, first of all as director of the famed American School of Oriental Studi Studies in Jerusalem, which is now named for him in the 1920s and 30s. It was my pleasure my last four years in Jerusalem to live, literally, in the house that Albright built and to direct that school, now named after him. From 1938 uh, on until 58, he served as professor at the Johns Hopkins University, where he turned out more than 100 PhDs in the fields he had mastered. Now, one of the chief distinguishing marks of the Albright School, whose overriding influence has only recently been challenged, was his insistence that archaeology was largely a branch of biblical studies and therefore should be defined as a special kind of research into the material culture and epigraphic discoveries of all the lands of the Bible. In one of Albright's much quoted definitions of biblical archaeology, he declared, quote, the term biblical archaeology may be restricted to Palestine or it may be extended to include anything that illustrates the Bible, however superficially. Accordingly, Albright said, I shall use the term biblical archaeology here to refer to all biblical lands from Spain to India and from southern Russia to southern Arabia and to the whole history of these lands from about 10,000 B.C. or even earlier to the present time, unquote. Only Albright could have made a statement like that. <coughs> now, this is a theoretical definition, of course, but to see how the biblical archaeology school operated in practice, we have only to look at the excavations sponsored by the Jerusalem School under Albright in the 20s and 30s, the heyday of field work for this particular school. If you did that, you would see that the projects were all carried out at Old Testament sites, directed by biblical scholars, almost all of them rather conservative Protestants, and funded by seminaries and church-related schools. That was biblical archaeology. Now, the agenda in those formative years was fixed by Albright's own primary research concerns, which remained remarkably consistent over a 50-year career. I can't go into detail, but in retrospect, it is now clear that Albright was reacting largely against the then prevailing extremes of 19th century European style literary criticism of the Bible. This had fragmented the Bible into late and heavily ed edited documents, as the critics called them, or literary sources, and had thus cast considerable doubt upon the historicity of much that the Bible contained. Now, lest we take this as simply another esoteric scholarly debate, and the word academic usually means irrelevant, we must recall that it was precisely this development in biblical studies that precipitated the early 20th century fundamentalist modernist controversy that split every major Protestant denomination in America and has shaped much of American religious life ever since, right up to the present moment. If you think fundamentalism is dead, you're wrong. 
Now, particularly at issue were the primeval and pre-monarchical history in the Pentateuch. That is, the biblical accounts of the patriarchal and mosaic eras. But the documentary hypothesis, as it came to be called, also regarded much of the books of Joshua Kings and even Samuel as late and unreliable sources. And above all, this school held that Israelite monotheism was a product of the post-exilic period, which the biblical writers had simply projected back into an imaginary mosaic era. If that were true, then the account in the Hebrew Bible of Israel's historical and religious developments was a purely literary fancy. To put it another way, the Bible contained little real history. All that was possible to recover was a history of the literature about the religion of Israel. And as one outraged evangelical put it, this view would make the Bible nothing more than a pious fraud. Now, although it was pioneered in Europe, the new literary or higher criticism of the Bible burst upon the American religious scene in the late 19th and early 20th century with a vengeance. It was not perceived as a serious threat to either Jewish or to Roman Catholic religious life, since both depended more on later tradition and ethnicity and piety than on the Bible as the primary source of authority. But for Protestantism, higher criticism struck a blow to the very heart the doctrine of verbal inspiration, the concept of the Bible as the very word of God. Already as early as the turn of the century, a few Protestant evangelicals had come up with the notion that archaeology, which was then opening up such unexpected new vistas on the long-lost biblical world, would come to their aid by proving the historicity of biblical personalities and events. And that's where biblical archaeology began. One of the earliest works I've been able to find in this vein was by A. H. Sace in 1894, Higher Criticism and the Monuments, or a slightly later work, Monumental Facts and Higher Critical Fancies. I like that one. <laughs> later, a prominent member of this school was Melvin Grove Kyle, who was in fact Albright's associate director on his famous excavations at Telbate Mearsom from 1926 to 1932. He was also a staunch Presbyterian who was one of the editors of that famous six-volume series called The Fundamentals, which gave its name to the controversy, Fundamentalist Modernist Controversy. Now, Kyle produced several typical books of this genre, now only historical curiosities, but once influential. One was entitled, 1912, The Deciding Voice of the Monuments in Biblical Criticism, or another, 1920, The Problem of the Pentateuch, a new solution by archaeological methods. Now, by the 1920s and 30s, there was a considerable literature in this vein in America. I have collected dozens and dozens and dozens of titles. One of my favorite books is this one by A. H. Prescott, 1933, The Spade and the Bible, Archaeological Discoveries Support the Old Book. And in that, a man by the name of Newton declared, and this was rather typical for the 30s, quote, not a ruined city, has been opened up that has given any comfort to unbelieving critics or evolutionists. Every find of archaeologists in Bible lands has gone to confirm scripture and to confound its enemies. Not since Christ ascended back to heaven have there been so many scientific proofs that God's word is truth." Unquote. Amen. <laughs> now, I want to stress that the contribution of Albright, however, was to elevate this amateur biblical archaeology of that early period to the level of a budding science, and at the same time to advance, of course, beyond the crude and naive biblicism of the work cited above to a sound, historically and critically based discipline of biblical history. And the result was a highly respected and widely influential school that represents biblical archaeology at its finest in contrast to the biblicist archaeology that still dominates the popular scene in America. Wherever I go to lecture, I find the prevalent notion that archaeology's chief business is to prove the Bible. And even though I reject the label biblical archaeologist, I can't get away from it. I'm always introduced as a biblical archaeologist. Now, the last and fullest and most controversial expression of American-style biblical archaeology was seen in the work of my own teacher at Harvard, the late George Ernest Wright. In the 1950s and through the 70s, Wright was at once a prominent Presbyterian churchman and a principal spokesman of the neo-Orthodox biblical theology movement 
and at the same time, the protege of Albright, who had become the leading American Palestinian archaeologist. When Wright left McCormick Theological Seminary, I al almost always say cemetery. I have a terrible mental block about that uh, because I spent four years incarcerated in one of these. Uh, in any case, in 58, he left McCormick Seminary to become Parkman Professor of Divinity in Harvard. He was able not only to continue and to expand his excavations at Shechem, the parade example of modern biblical archaeology, but also to train a new generation of younger Palestinian archaeologists who today, without exception, dominate the field. All of my colleagues and contemporaries are Wright students or now students of Wright students. I have 24 doctoral students of my own at Arizona now, third generation Albrightians. Now, in 1952, Wright had produced a little book that became a classic of American biblical theology, God Who Acts, Biblical Theology as Recital. It is clear that Wright also was reacting against post-war uh, conceptions of the Bible, especially in European circles, as mythology that had to be demythologized, a la Bultmann and other uh, European theologians. And therefore, Wright stressed, rather, the historical basis of biblical religion, which he thought consisted in essence of Israel's confessional rec uh, uh, recitation of the Magnalia Dei, the mighty acts of God on behalf of his people. It is fitting that his festschrift, published just after his death, is entitled Magnalia Dei. Wright declared that, quote, to participate in biblical faith means that we must indeed take history seriously as the primary data of that faith. He went even farther to say that, quote, in biblical faith, everything depends upon whether the central events, that is, the deliverance from Egypt, the giving of the law at Sinai, the conquest of Canaan, actually occurred. Everything depends on that. And finally, Wright, the theologian and archaeologist, invoked both modern historical and literary criticism, uh, as well as the recent progress of archaeology, to defend what he called a greater confidence in the basic reliability of biblical history. Now, I, the point I want to make is that this may be conservatism. It is not fundamentalism. Neither Albright nor Wright was a fundamentalist. I might mention that Wright's works in the 50s, when he began to publish in this vein, had a powerful impact in Europe. In, 19, uh, uh, in the late 1950s, there were several serious attacks by German scholars on the American school of Albright and Wright. In 1956, a German journalist by the name of Werner Keller seized upon the issues in a book that soon became a runaway bestseller and is still widely read and quoted. Someone always asks me about this book. The Bible is History, a confirmation of the book of books. Few have noted that the German original is titled Und die Bibel hat doch recht, and the Bible was right after all. Another person was drawn into this controversy in the 50s, the well-known American rabbi, explorer, archaeologist, Nelson Glick of blessed memory, another protege of Albright and a colleague of, all, of, of Wright. He became involved in this controversy when he was attacked by some of his colleagues who were suspicious of his entitling his Middle Bronze I explorations in the Negev of Israel as the age of Abraham in the Negev. Wright came to Glick's defense in an article in the Biblical Archaeologist that became a minor classic. Is Nelson Glick's aim to prove the Bible? Wright said no, but suspicions lingered. Now, Wright's views on biblical archaeology are particularly important because despite his claim that the discipline had been created earlier by Albright, his teacher, many would credit Wright himself with that peculiar coupling of biblical archaeology and biblical theology. Albright only talked about history. Now, in 1947, here is Ernest's first definition of biblical archaeology, produced almost verbatim in all his later works. Quote, biblical archaeology is a special armchair variety of general archaeology. The biblical archaeologist may or may not be an excavator himself, but he studies the discoveries of the excavations in order to glean from them every fact that throws a direct, indirect, or even diffuse light upon the Bible. He must be intelligently concerned with stratigraphy and typology upon which the method of modern archaeology rests, yet his chief concern is not with methods or pots or weapons in themselves alone. His central and absorbing interest is the understanding and exposition of the scriptures. It would have been helpful had other biblical archaeologists been that candid. <laughs> 
Now, as for my own critique, I have written on the subject of biblical archaeology for the last 15 years or so in a steady stream of archaeology, uh, of articles, uh, what someone has called the Devarian deluge upon this subject. And I won't try to summarize all of that here, but uh, I would simply contend that biblical archaeology, that the movement in its classic form, which dominated the American scene up until around 1970, was really not so much a branch of Near Eastern archaeology at all as it was a subsidiary of biblical and theological studies. Indeed, biblical archaeology is unique in representing a chapter in American religious life. This school drew its agenda not from archaeology, but from problems of biblical research. Its method stressed academic training in biblical languages and history, plus practical field experience in learning how to dig at a biblical site, but it did not incorporate graduate professional work in archaeology, anthropology, or science. We were all woefully undertrained in those areas. The practitioners were all, without exception, biblical scholars and teachers, mostly amateur archaeologists in the sense of being part-time and proud of it. The sites chosen for excavation were all biblical. The support came from seminaries and church-related institutions and individuals. The principal strategies, stratigraphy and ceramic typology and chronology, which were indeed developed to a high level of perfection, focused primarily on recovering, as I have said, not social or economic history, but political history, the history of pivotal individuals and public events. Particularly important were fortification systems, public buildings, pottery sequences, and especially destruction layers. Biblical archaeologists love destruction layers. And all of this, it was thought, could be related directly, directly to biblical literature and to the supposedly historical accounts they contained. One could leap directly from the trench into the pages of Genesis. Now, we shall see presently that already in these earliest formulations, there were sown the seeds of the movement's dissolution. Now, let me turn specifically to Syro-Palestinian archaeology. I said in the beginning that there were two streams, and we talked a little bit about biblical archaeology, but there was another stream which we may call the secular stream. And this includes some of the most ambitious American work in the Middle East, yet it has not received the attention it deserves. The secular stream began in Palestine, in fact, with Harvard University's excavations at Samaria in 1908-10, carried out with brilliance by the American archaeologist G.A. Reisner, years ahead of his time and method, the first modern excavation in Palestine. Then there followed the large and lavish pre-war projects of Yale University at Jarash, ancient Garaza in Transjordan in the 20s and 30s, of the University of Pennsylvania at Beth Shan in the same period, and especially of the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago under Breasted and others at the great site of Megiddo. These excavations were exactly contemporary with those of Albright and the biblical archaeologist in Palestine, but they were staffed and supported exclusively by secular circles. Yet this school, despite a more prestigious university base and much more adequate financial backing, never really won the hearts of the American people the way the biblical archaeology school of the same period did. And that first generation of secular archaeologists simply could not replace itself, in particular after the Second War when momentum was lost. By the 1950s and on into the 1960s, biblical archaeology almost completely dominated American-Palestinian archaeology. In Jordan, in addition to Wright's Harvard Drew McCormick excavations at Shechem, there were excavations then in the field carried out by James Pritchard, professor of biblical thought at the University of Pennsylvania, and also an Episcopal clergyman at LG, Biblical Gibeon, by Paul W. Laff for a consortium of Lutheran schools at Tanakh, Rumate, and elsewhere, and by Joseph A. Calloway of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary at the biblical site of I. On a typical one of these excavations, the funds would have come from Protestant seminaries, and the staff would have been made up exclusively of biblical scholars, theologians, church historians, and the like. And, of course, all of the staff members were men. There were no clergy persons of the feminist persuasion in those days. Shechem was a typical example. We were all students of right. All of us were ordained clergymen. All of us had advanced degrees in theology before we came to Harvard. None of us is active anymore. We've all become rather professional archaeologists. But as someone uh, remarked, we were not really defrocked, just unsuited. <laughs> 